towards lactose. I don't have to give up on milk. I can get lactose-free milk. If I have an intolerance towards gluten, I don't have to give up on bread. They got gluten-free products. We have all sort of fill-in-the-blank free products in this world. Things which rid themselves of the irritant. Right? Sometimes we look at Christianity and we look at Christianity perhaps as a little bit of an irritating lifestyle. There are some irritants that are involved in Christianity. What have I told you? That God's intention was that you and I could live a worry-free Christianity. Worry-free Christianity, that seems kind of uh, out there. It really does. It seems kind of out there, but I hope this morning I can persuade you that's God's intention. You know, it seems out there because I think one of the things we've grown most accustomed to is the idea of worrying. We're, we've grown uh, so accustomed to it that it really becomes like second nature for us to worry about the things of this world. We worry about what we're going to wear. You know, I thought about last night what I'm going to wear. We worry about what we're going to eat. Uh, before worship started, I was thinking about what am I going to eat for lunch? Do I need to set out some meat? Do I, what am I going to do? Um, we worry about how God will provide for us. We worry about how he's going to take care of us. We worry about how all of our needs are going to be met. We're anxious in those areas. But when we look in Matthew chapter 6, we see that the Lord is telling us not to worry about those things. In fact, what he does is he illustrates that for us. He speaks about the care and provision that God has given towards the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. You know... It, we look at how the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, those things are cared for. And we look at them as a, such a simplistic way to be cared for. Okay, the lilies of the field, they have the dew in the morning. The, uh, the birds of the air, they, they get the, the worm if they get up early, you know, or the bird gets the worm. I mean, you look at all of that and we say, that's pretty easy, that's pretty simple, there's not a whole lot of complex, uh, complexity to it. But when God talks about it, in Matthew chapter 6, he compares it, he contrasts it with the way that Solomon took care of himself. And he says that the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, these things are taken care of in a far better way than even Solomon, who was the richest king in Israel's history, cared for himself. Sometimes we think that we're not taken care of enough. Sometimes because we're, we think we're not taken care of enough, we worry about what it is we're going to have. But if we look in verses 31 and 32, Jesus tells us how we're to think regarding this situation of what am I going to do about my food, my clothing, my shelter, and so forth. Verse 31 and 32, Therefore do not be anxious, 
saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. That little portion right there, your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, that's God saying, I'm taking care of it for you. I know what you need. I'm going to give you those things. Don't allow your life to be consumed with those questions. What shall I eat? What shall I wear? What shall I drink? Where am I going to stay? How am I going to provide for this need in my life? Don't let your life become consumed with that, but rather let it be consumed with something else. And that would be verse 33. You see that first word there, but? That's a contrast. Here's what I'm telling you not to do, verses 31 and 32. Here's what I'm telling you to do, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Verse 33 is the thesis statement for worry-free Christianity. If I want to live worry-free Christianity, as the Lord intends that I do, then I'm going to do these certain things. We're going to break down here from verse 33. Four things I need to be mindful of. I need to be mindful of the pursuit. I need to be mindful of the priority. I need to be mindful of the pair. And I need to be mindful of the promise. Now we look here at the pursuit. You see that with the word seek. But seek. When we look at uh, that word seek, what, what does that tell you, man? I mean, that, that's, that's plain English. You get it. It means you make that what you're going after. You make that what you are pursuing. If you are going to seek something mentally, that means you meditate upon it, you pray for it. If you're going to seek something physically, that means you have a craving for it. You're starving for it. And so as we think of this word seek, I mean, you think about deer at a deer lease, for instance. You've got deer at a deer lease. Do they have a certain path in which they most likely go? Yeah, they do. You see, same thing with cattle. All animals, they have a certain path they trod. That's going to lead them to food. That's going to lead them to water. That's going to lead them to their place of shelter. Very rarely are you going to see those animals uh, divert from that path. And that's because they know how to go. They know where to go in order to get the things that they are seeking. I am hungry. I need to go here. I am thirsty. I need to go here. It is time to go to sleep. I need to go here. Each one of us, you know, have that animalistic uh, tendency to wear a path. We call that our daily routine. I have a daily routine. I wake up, I do a certain thing a certain way. I go to a certain place every single day. I keep a certain schedule. That is the way I go. Why? Because I'm seeking to achieve things. I come to the church building Monday through Thursday because I'm seeking to please the eldership. <laughs> right? That's what we do. That is my desire. That is uh, why we go places. I want to make money, so I'm going to go to work. You want to make money, you're going to go to work. You're seeking that financial care. There's some verses that come to mind whenever I think about the idea of seeking or pursuing something. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, for instance, And without faith it is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who who seek him. Some translations say diligently seek him. The idea is seeking after something until you find it. It's like Luke 15. Remember in Luke 15, you had 100 sheep. You have 99 of them still in your collection. One goes missing. You know what Jesus said? He, speak, he asked a question rhetorically. Which one of you does not go out and look for the sheep until you find it? Who is not going to do that? You have the woman with the lost coin. Jesus, again, rhetorically, which one of you would not 
search diligently for that coin, sweeping the floor, moving the cushions, looking with every ounce of your being for that one little coin. You're not going to say, well, I don't know where it is right now. Let me just wipe it out of my memory. That's the type of pursuit we're talking about here. This is a diligent pursuit. This is going uh, beyond uh, what we might think reasonable, if you, if you would say. This is about seeking with your whole heart. You know, in Matthew chapter 7 and verses 7 and 8, Jesus spoke about those who seek with their whole heart. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. The context here is prayer. The context of everything we're discussing right here. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. This all backs up to prayer. Matthew chapter 6. Our context begins with Jesus instructing the disciples how to pray. In that prayer, he said that we are to pray, give us this day our daily bread. The context is prayer. The question has been bread, and the dependency has been placed upon God throughout this whole situation. You ask for God for your bread. You trust in God to provide your bread, and you know that whenever you ask for God, for that bread, he is going to give you that bread. You ask, you seek, you knock, you're going to receive. We think about seeking. We think about coming to God, drawing near to him in prayer, making our prayers and supplications known to him. Philippians 4 and verse 6 comes to mind. With thanksgiving, Paul says, let your requests be made known to God. You know what that context is about? About worrying. Matthew chapter 6 is about worrying. What do the two have in common? You want to resolve worry? Go to God in prayer. Seek Him. Pursue Him. We combat our worries by going to God in prayer. Seeking in this context, of course, has to do with, with prayer, but also has to do with the idea of craving. But seek first doesn't just mean to look first but to desire first. We are to crave. You know, almost every night, somewhere between 11.30 to midnight, I walk to the fridge because I'm hungry. I'm craving something. I open my fridge, not because, uh, hey, I'm full. Let me, let me see what I have that I can throw out. I'm hungry. Let me see what I have that I can eat. That's why I'm going to the fridge. If I'm seeking God, it needs to be because I'm craving Him. Psalm 63 in verse 1, the psalmist said, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul, listen to it, thirst for you. My flesh faints for you. As in the dry and green land in which there is no water. The psalmist is saying, I'm hungering for you. I'm thirsting for you. I'm longing for you. I'm seeking you, O oh God. I am pursuing you. If we have a desire to truly live a worry-free Christianity, here's our first key to obtaining it. Have the right pursuit. Have the right pursuit. Pursue Him. Seek Him. Next, we notice the priority first. This is the most important word in the whole sentence, first. I say that because it's the most often failed portion. There's a lot of people who seek God. They don't seek Him first. Think about what Jesus meant whenever He said, seek first. Was He telling us, make, make it a top five priority. Put it, put it up there with, with, with the rest of them. It's okay if it's not first first. Just as long as it's important. That's how a lot of people treat it. But I guarantee you that's not what Jesus is saying. When Jesus uses the word first, he means the first in honor. He means the first place. He means the chief item. It is, as we would say, the apple to your eye. You want that more than anything. You desire it more than anything. It consumes your life. 
We are to seek first. We are to prioritize. You know, in Mark chapter 12, Jesus was being tested by one of the scribes. The scribe asked him the question. Notice the question. Which commandment is the most important? Which commandment is the most important? What's the scribe asking? Tell me what's number one. Tell me what comes before anything else. How does Jesus respond? Jesus answered the most important is. Jesus is saying the very first. This is the thing which comes before all other commandments of God. The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That is the most important. That is what comes very first. Putting God very first. He deserves the chief seat. He deserves the honor. He deserves first place of our lives. He is the principal focus of our lives. He is before everything. He is before mother and father. He's before son and daughter, brother and sister. He's even before myself. He needs to be before myself if he is going to be first. And that's where so many of us falter at times. Sometimes we fail to put God first. Something interesting to me is, you know, when God is making himself known to the Israelites, he's providing them the, uh, the Ten Commandments. The commandment that always comes to my mind, Exodus 20 and verse 3, you shall have no gods before me. God made it very clear from the beginning, I am first. There is not going to be anything in your care that is to rival me. And that's an issue that the Israelites had. You know, the issue with them taking upon different gods, think about 1 Kings 18, for example. Elijah is having to show down with the prophets of Baal, right? And Elijah, it's like you have Elijah here, you have the prophets of Baal, and then you have the whole nation of Israel as the audience. And Elijah turns to the nation of Israel and says, how long are you going to go limping between two opinions? If God is God, then serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. We're going to make a decision today. It is time for you to make a decision. Who is really God? And so that showdown com, uh, comes to uh, place because here's where Israel made the mistake. They believed in God, but they also kept Baal as a safety net. They worshipped Jehovah God, but they worshipped Baal as well. They didn't trust in God to actually care for them to the fullest extent. They kind of looked at it and said, you know, uh, in case Jehovah God fails us in this area, perhaps Baal can provide for us. And so that's why they serve those multiple gods. Do you think we do any different? Why do you think Jesus made that statement in Matthew 6 and verse 24? No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one, love the other. He will be despised by the one. Uh, and devoted to the other. You cannot serve God and money. Sometimes, sometimes we really come into the pattern of placing God uh, first, but placing a foreign God second in case our first place flakes out. And really, you kind of ask the question, you know, which one is worse? Having God at second string? Are having a second string for God. Doubting his ability to provide. You know, both of those mistakes are, are ones that we routinely make. And they're both the reason for the, term, uh, the turmoil that we often place into our lives. So a question that comes up, you know, we fall into the pattern, God's not first. If he is first, someone else is second. Someone else we're trusting enough to fill in the gaps where God leaves out. If we have that sort of mentality, how do we correct that? Look at me in 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17, I, I, I think, provides a little insight to how we overcome this. 
verses 8 through 16, you have the, this is somewhat of a familiar story. You have the widow of Zarephath. And um, in the first seven verses, Elijah makes a prediction of a drought. And so with drought comes famine. So there's scarcity in the land. You have the widow of Zarephath. Let's, let's read verses uh, 8, 8 through 16. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, verse 12, Here it is. This is where we really need to be taking note here. Verses 12 and following. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar, and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple sticks and may go and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Verse 12. She doesn't have a lot. Here she is. She's resorting to eating sticks with her flour. And she's looking at it as, this is our last meal. This is the very bottom of the barrel for us. Verse 13. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. But first, Elijah says, doesn't that sound like what God said? Sometimes we look at, look at God's expectations for us. We acknowledge what we have, and we say, we have so little, how can I spare? God says, make this for me first. How does that work out for us? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 14. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day of the Lord, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she sent, uh, and she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent. Neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, and he spoke by Elijah. What did she do? She trusted. She trusted the word of the Lord. She didn't go back and say, yeah, but... Again, this is all I have. I have just enough to make a last meal for me and my son. No, when Elijah said, you go make this for me first. Then you go and make your other food. Everything's going to be taken care of. You're going to be blessed exponentially. You think about the measure in which she was blessed. How long of a drought was it that Elijah predicted? Seven years, I think. Seven years? And she got to live on the, the little bit of supplies, right, that she thought was going to be her last meal. Seven years? That's blessed me on measure. Here's what we need to really gather from here. You put God first. You don't have no safety net for him. And when if you put God first, he's going to bless you exponentially. He's going to bless you beyond measure. You put him first. If you want to achieve worry-free Christianity... You need to pursue your God and you need to prioritize him as first in your life and him alone. Now let's return to Matthew 6 and verse 33. Let's notice here the pair. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let's discuss the kingdom of God right quick. The kingdom of God, you consider in the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He saw four, four, uh, or really he saw one figure made of the four elements. And in that, a stone was cut out of a mountain. It hits the uh, figure. The figure falls to pieces, right? That figure, Daniel 2 and verse 44, is revealed to us as the kingdom of God. 
This is a kingdom, Daniel 2 and verse 45, that is not made with hands, meaning that it's a spiritual kingdom. Daniel again has a vision, Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14. This is a vision of the Son of Man. And what is it that the Son of Man is going to receive? He receives a kingdom that is eternal and cannot be destroyed with hands. Why? Because it is a spiritual kingdom. It is one that is going to come with power, just as Jesus spoke about in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. It is one, it is a kingdom that is established by God himself. You think about Acts chapter 2, the church's establishment. It is the kingdom, the church, which Philip preached regarding in Acts chapter 8. You put first the church. Put first the church. We are to seek first. We're to pursue and prioritize the Lord's church. If we're very real, we can ask this question, isn't it? Church first and foremost in our lives. This one's a hard one for me, right? Because every now and then we have bad days, right? And sometimes with those bad days, we fall into the pattern of going with emotion. Here's the question. Are we as eager to come to the Lord's house as perhaps our own house at the end of the day? That's a tough question to answer. It's a real tough question to answer. Where do our resources, our time, and energy go first? The Lord's church or our home? You know, there's nothing wrong with taking care of, of our home. But we just got to make sure that the Lord's house is first. That was the issue with the people in Haggai's day. Haggai the prophet comes and says, Do you, what is wrong with you? You have paneled houses and the Lord's house lies in ruins. People sometimes fall in the pattern of taking care of themselves and then taking care of God last. So seek first his kingdom, seek first the church, and also his righteousness. This word righteousness is dealing with his commandments. Psalm 119 and verse 172 tells us that the, right, that the uh, commandments of God are righteousness. In Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, we have the pattern by which we seek. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to uh, do it and to teach his statutes and laws, his rules in Israel. That is uh, the pattern which we follow. Ezra put God's righteousness first. We can do the same thing. Could our name even be filled in there? Cody has set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach its rules and statutes and all of Israel. Could I put my name there? Uh, no, probably not consistent. Probably not consistent. You know, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. <clears throat> Last night, I got a notification on my phone. You probably got the same notification. It's about your screen time, right? Did you get that notification last night? Maybe mine said for Saturday night, so I don't know. But usually, especially if you're an iPhone user, you get a notification about once a week that tells you how much screen time you've had. On that, you can look and say, okay, I spent 18 minutes texting. I spent an hour and 15 minutes on Facebook. I spent, you fill in the dot. Now, I just want to imagine, for, for the sake of imagining, I take that number of screen time. I compare that with the number of study time. How would that number compare? Or really, you think about before smartphones. You had, how much time were you spending watching TV? I forget what they say the, the average person spends watching TV. It's a lot of time. It's definitely not the same amount of time that we spend in the Word. Definitely not the same amount of time that we spend in the Lord's, uh, in, in doing the Lord's works of righteousness for the church. You know, if we look at those numbers, what we need to do, what we need to be able to do at the end of the day is we need to be able to look at that number, that comparison. Here's what I've been spending on, on my phone. Here's what I've been spending doing this hobby. Here's what I've been spending doing X, Y, and Z. Compare it with studying the word, being with the Lord's people, things of that nature. We need to be able to stand on the day of judgment, look at that comparison, and be confident enough to say, Lord, I put your church, I put your word, I put you before everything else. 
Are we going to be able to stand before the Lord and say that? With confidence. I'm persuaded at this moment, I'm not. And it's okay to be honest about that. Because you know what? You make an honest statement, you can make an honest change. All of us, I'm sure, need to make that honest change. Let's notice this last part of Matthew 6 and verse 33. Let's notice the promise. Jesus says, all these things will be added to you. All these things. Think about it in the context. This is a reference to food and clothing. Jesus said, verse 32, these are the things that the Gentiles seek after. But in contrast to them, you, me, we're seeking the Lord's church. We're seeking him. We're seeking his righteousness. Whenever we do such things, when we seek those things, that's when all these things, clothing and whatnot, are going to be added to us. The things that they are seeking after are already provided to you because of your because you have your priorities right. It's like this, for instance, 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon gets the opportunity to make a request to God. God says, ask me for anything. Solomon had the opportunity to ask God for riches. He had the opportunity to ask God for women. He had the opportunity to ask for anything. God said, ask me anything, I'll give it to you. What does he ask for? Wisdom. What does he receive? Wisdom, wealth, power, all these other things. Why? Because his priorities were in the right place. Solomon said, give me wisdom that I may lead this great people of yours. When we seek the right thing, when we seek his kingdom, when we seek his righteousness, then he says, you sought the right thing. I'm going to give you all these other things too. You can have the food, you can have the clothing, I'll provide those things for you because your priorities were in the right place. The issue comes up, as we brought up before, do we trust God? You know, it's evident that all men seek God at some point in their lives. The issue is that they don't seek Him first. Sometimes they look for God after they achieve something. How many times have you heard that before? Well, once I get this, I'll be at church. Once I can put this behind me, I'll be there. How many times have you heard that? Your priorities are in the wrong place. You're not going to get that. You're never going to get that. Because your priorities are in the wrong place. How many times do, uh, do people wait until things go wrong? Everything has gone amok. I need to go to church. I need to... Show God, hey, I care somewhat so he can bless me all the way. Is that going to happen? No, man. You think God can't see past all that fakeness? He sees right there with me. We have to really trust the promise that God has. If we trust that putting him first, his kingdom first, his word first, his righteousness first, and if we trust that pursuing those things first and foremost above everything else if we trust that those will give us the promise that he, he has given then we're going to get it we're going to achieve it we're going to be blessed here's some passages to consider look with me right quick at Psalm 34 verses 8 and 10 we're nearing the end I, I assure you Psalm 34 verses 8 through 10 Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is a man who takes refuge in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints, for those who fear Him have no lack. The young lion suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. What does that sound like to you? Sounds a lot like, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Sounds to me like worry free Christianity. Look over at Psalm 37. Look at verses 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Look at verse 17. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. 
Look at verse um, 19 here. They are not put to shame in evil times. Talking about the righteous. In the days of famine, in the days in which there's little, they have abundance. They're taken care of. Verses uh, 25 and 26. I have, been in, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Again, what does this sound like? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Worry free Christianity. Do we really trust in the promises of God? That's what we need to ask ourselves. There's a guarantee with it. Seek me, and I will give you all these things. But you must trust. How much time do you think we spend worrying about the things that the world worries about? Knowing all the while that God says he will take care of that. You take care of getting your life in order. You take care of putting God first, setting your priorities accordingly, pursuing the right things, and he will take care of you. Matthew 6 and verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's worry-free Christianity. But it's only worry-free if we are pursuing God, if he is first in our lives, if his kingdom and his word are our focus. Now, of course, the idea of worry-free Christianity, you know, all these things will be added to you. That's not him saying, I'm going to bless you uh, with the nicest house in the block. I'm not going to bless you with steaks to eat every night. I'm not going to bless you beyond uh, comparison to the rest of the world so that everyone looks at you and goes, oh, surely they must be righteous. Why? Because they're the richest people on the planet. That's not what he's saying. He's saying he's going to take care of us. He is going to provide for us every single need. You think about every single physical need that we have. Yeah, that stirs up a whole lot of worry. But what about our spiritual needs? Our spiritual needs are so much greater than our physical needs. And if God can take care of our physical needs, surely He can take care of our spiritual needs. Surely, if I'm a Christian, and let's say I've gone on sinning deliberately, Hebrews 10, verses 26 and 28, which tells me that I'm making, a, uh, I, I'm, I'm making common the covenant of blood, I, I, I'm disrespecting the blood that was shed for me, surely... One of my worries ought to be, can I be forgiven of that? Yes, you can. First John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We think about us outside of Christ. You know, Chris made the statement, so many people are, are um, overbeared by the guilt of sin that they say, I possibly cannot be forgiven. Paul said, I am chief of sinners. I am foremost. Why? So that the grace of God may be demonstrated through me. God desires all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. He desires that none perish. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. He already acknowledges the fact that none of us are righteous. Romans 3 and verse 10. He's well aware of that. He knew that when he created us. But yet he says, I'm going to provide the path for righteousness. What's that path for righteousness? Here he is, man. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14 and verse 6. How do I come to him? What must I do to be saved? Acts 2 and verse 37. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You do these things. God will take care of you. You will be added to his church. Acts 2 and verse 47. You will receive an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, uh, undefiable. 1 Peter 1 and verse 4. And if you're faithful, speaking of that inheritance, if you're faithful, you live your life in such a way that God can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Guess what you receive? 
crown of life, Romans or uh, Revelation 2 and verse 10. He is waiting to bless those who need Him and to bless them beyond measure, Ephesians 3 and verse 20. All we have to do is be willing to come. If you have a need this morning to put your Lord on in baptism, we invite you to come. If you have a need to confess sin before the congregation, perhaps you have an issue in your life that needs resolving, come as together we stand.